Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, home of the Tina Turner Museum. Thank you, Emily. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, before I introduce today's very special guest, what is something you've discovered this week here at Discovery Park of America? Here at Discovery Park, we have a pretty extensive military gallery, and we feature things from World War II and I found out that we have two displays of replicas of two of the atomic bombs dropped during the war called Little Boy and Fat Man. I didn't know their names. Oh, there you go. See, a lot of people do. If you take somebody through that gallery, they're going to ask about that. So today's uh, guest is so special. This is uh, Bill Allen we're going to be chatting with today. Bill has a remarkable story of his experiences serving in the Navy as a medic during World War II, where he was part of D-Day. Tell me a little bit about uh, where you grew up. I was born here in Mercerburg, went to school here, city school, uh, played basketball, baseball all the way through high school. Uh, stayed here until I went into the Navy. Was gone three years, came back to Mercerburg, and been here ever since. What made you want to sign up for the Navy or were you drafted? How did you end up in the Navy? No, I was drafted. I was 18. My birthday was May the 18th. And at that time, if you had a birthday, 18 years old, you left. It didn't matter how much time schooling you had left. But I knew I was safe. And I stayed until I graduated from high school. 18th of May, I registered for the draft, graduated from high school, and was 18 years old all the same day. Uh, did you have any idea where you were headed? No, we caught the train here at Murfreesboro, headed towards Chattanooga. Uh, we got off in Chattanooga, went to Fort Oglethorpe, spent three or four days there, went into building for interview. I talked to some army officer, he asked three or four questions. He said, you go to that group right over there. I said, yes, sir. I got over there and come find out he would put me in the Navy. And I thought I was in the Army. So that's how I got into the Navy. But uh, we left Chattanooga then, rode, oh, left Chattanooga, if I remember correctly, 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning. Got into Knoxville late that afternoon, uh, headed straight on, rode all night, got into Washington, D.C. the next morning. We got off and had breakfast, and back on another train, kept going on through Baltimore, on up just before we left Maryland, a town called Port Deposit. Possibly you've heard of it. Uh, but actually, where we got off the train was a little I didn't see anything except a train station, but called Perryville. And that was Bainbridge, Maryland, was where I took boot camp. We was there all oh, about seven weeks from the time we checked in to the time we graduated. And boot camp was over. If I remember correctly, I think it was 120 in our company. About half went straight to sea. About half of us got a service school. Well, I was sent to hospital core school. I knew so much about medicine. I didn't know aspirin from a band aid. But anyway, that's how I got into Navy hospital core. But went through core school, took classes, anatomy, first aid, minor surgery, medications, uh, another course or two, and uh, graduated from Core school, went to Memphis, then Billington Naval Hospital there. Was there about uh, 
oh, two and a half, maybe three months. Checked out and went to Lido Beach out of Long Island, New York, where I was waiting for a ship to come in. I was there, I don't know, a month, maybe six weeks. Ship came in, LST-523. They carried us back down to Bayonne, New Jersey. We caught the ship, took off, stopped in Boston for a couple of days, then went on up to Halifax, Nova Scotia, where we picked up the main convoy. And then we headed across. How long uh, were you serving before uh, June 6, 1944? I actually was sworn into the Navy on August the 4th. D-Day was June the 6th, 1944. But I was sworn in 43 in August, so uh, what is that, nine, ten months before the invasion. Now, we landed in Plymouth, England, I believe, on April 15th. But we spent uh, close to a month in and out to uh, Falmouth, Weymouth, Foley, any number of those little towns on the southern coast. Of, we left the ship. The medics did for two weeks of chemical warfare in case they used gas. Back to the ship, we started making bandages, uh, sterilizing all of our instruments. At that time, we were reused everything. We didn't have any throwaways. We made a lot of our own dressings. We stocked first aid cabinets. Uh, we got ready for the invasion. Uh, we loaded up two or three times with the Army, go out into the channel, turn around, come back, and unload. I guess they're practicing how they get the most ships, something on it. I don't know the reason for it, but uh, we've done that two or three times. And then uh, June the 3rd or 4th, we loaded up. And we didn't go out into the channel. We just waited right there. But we knew something was up. And after dark, we took off. And we got into Normandy uh, the afternoon of D-Day. For those of you who've forgotten your history, D-Day was part of Operation Overlord. It took place on June 6, 1944. It was the largest invasion ever assembled before or since. There were more than 150,000 Allied troops by sea and on air that landed on five beachheads in Normandy, France. We weren't able to actually hit the beach. I was on LST, which is a landing craft. I'm assuming you know about a landing craft. Mm -hmm. It goes in to the beach and opens the lab doors, lets you ramp down, you load and unload on dry land when the tide's out. When the tide comes back in, you have to be ready to shove off. But anyway, we got in there, uh, to Omaha Beach, on D-Day afternoon. We couldn't hit the beach because it hadn't been secured. We had to anchor out in three or four feet of water. We opened the bow doors, let the ramp down, started unloading. I saw the foot troops with those heavy backpacks go down that ramp, lose the footing, drown right there at the end of the ramp. I saw foot soldiers that made it into the beach, half dozen to a dozen steps, 15 and 20 steps at the most, step on a landmine, life was over. We brought some back that we carried over. They well and happy. Good shape, we carried them in dead when we brought them back. Mm. This is war. This is memories that are still very strong. Yeah, that uh, so many people died 
there. I know the National D Day Memorial Foundation um, has has tried to uh, keep up with who who died on D Day at their memorial site in Bedford, Virginia. There are four thousand four hundred and fourteen names on a bronze plaque that represent every Allied soldier who died that day. I read that you did not talk about your time at war for a very long time. Um, what made you finally start talking about it? One day, in 2013, I was home by myself. My wife had gone to church to a watercoloring class. And normally I didn't answer the phone when I was there by myself. It very like it wouldn't be for me, and I'd forget to tell her or get the message mixed up. So I just let it ring, and the answering service would pick up. But anyway... That morning, I was phoned right beside my lounge chair there. I read that piece over, picked it up. The voice on the other end said, uh, this is Doug Hamilton with PBS in New York City. I said, were you in 300th Battalion of the Combat Engineers? I said, no, sir. No, sir, I was not. I was in the Navy. Oh, he said, you was in the Navy? I said, yes, sir. He said, were you by any chance on LST-523? I said, I was. He said, were you on it when it was sunk? I said, yes, sir, I was. He said, you're the one I'm looking for. He said, we're making a documentary for the 70th anniversary. He said, how's your health? Well, I said, it's all right as far as I know. He said, you're not on a walker or crutches? I said, oh, no, no. He said, you married? I said, yes, sir. How's your wife's health? I said, it's better than mine. But he said, we'd like to invite you and your wife back for three or four or five days, do some filming and some interviews back to Omaha Beach. I said, oh, my goodness. I said, sir, I don't make decisions that important without consulting my wife. I said, we just don't make decisions without consulting each other on something like that. He said, I understand. Said, I'll call you at 11 o'clock tomorrow for your answer. I hung up. Well, when my wife got home, I told her she'd have got her other dress. We'd have left that afternoon if she'd had her way. <laughs> she had tried to get me to go for the 50th anniversary. I said, No, nope. I lost everything I had over there, but they can keep it. I'm not going back. I have no desire to go back. For the 60th anniversary, she said, you still haven't changed your mind? I said, no, nope, I never intend to go back. But for the 70th anniversary, I had read where our ship had been preserved on the bottom of the English Channel, uh, what was left of it. And it, it was possible to get in a little small submarine and go down and see it. Well, I thought that'd be interesting. Maybe that would take place on this trip. We ever have a chance to go back. So uh, he called back the next day. We told him we would we'll go, but that I had some reservations about just wife myself at my age. I think I was 88, 89 at that time, late 80s anyway. And uh, I said, as long as we stay in the States, I'm all right. But going through Paris, if we had some problems, I'd rather one of my daughters be with us. He said, we'll take her. Well, I said, you're creating another problem. He <laughs> said, what's that? I said, I have two daughters. I don't know which one has. <laughs> he said, we'll take a bow. <laughs> wow. So that's great. He said that the lady that worked at the itinerary would be in touch with us. And she called the next day and started making all the arrangements. The following Saturday, uh, we went to Nashville, caught a plane, flew to New York at uh, two or three hours and lay over there. Caught a plane, flew all night into Paris. Uh, got in there about you know, six o'clock, if I remember correctly, Sunday morning. Went to a hotel to step to noon. Got up and had a guy to catch us all over Paris that night or uh, that afternoon. Uh, we saw the uh, Eiffel Tower, all the many things that you see around Paris. 
Uh, I spent the night there, got up the next morning. They had transportation for us. We headed to Normandy. We got into there, oh, 12, 30, 1 o'clock. They had built a restaurant, not on the beach, but back, far up back, but overlooking the beach. Very nice restaurant. We had lunch there and met all the uh, PBS people. Must have been eight or ten of them. Cabermen, directors, producers, all they takes to make a documentary. Fine, fine people. That afternoon, we went to uh, American Cemetery. They are overlooking Omaha Beach. One of the most sacred places I think I've ever been. Every blade of grass was cut just so, so. Every shrub was trimmed. It is perfect. We had two doctors aboard ship with us. One of them was buried there. The only one that I know of off our ship that was buried, the rest of it was lost at sea. But anyway, he's buried there. The young doctor had just finished at Michigan, but a very outstanding doctor. I think he had a great career ahead of him. But, uh, his career ended right there. But anyway, we spent the afternoon there. Very, very impressive as to the cost of what our freedom has been. We went into Sherbourg, spent the night there, caught a ship the next morning, small ship, maybe 100, 125 feet long, riding down the channel, perfect weather, channel just as smooth as it could be. Very, very enjoyable ride. Went down the channel, went by Utah Beach, got to Omaha Beach. You could see it all five miles into the beach there. We began to slow down, came to a stop where the cook had fixed them punch and cookies or finger foods. And we were standing there enjoying refreshments. And Doug said, uh, Bill said, we're right on top of what's left of your ship now. He said, would you like to go down and see it? I said, sure. So with that, for the deep sea divers, they began to get ready. The pilot and his assistant began to get ready. The submarine was shaped sort of like an egg. Uh, I guess it's the longest point, six or seven feet. So that gives you general size of it. It's small. We had to go up a six foot step ladder to the top and go down in it. They closed the hatch, lifted us over into the water, and we began to go down. Went to the bottom of the English Channel. There's our ship at about a 45 degree angle, wedged it to the sand. We went around and around and up and over it. I saw where I had jumped from. I saw a lot of things that brought back many memories. The assistant pilot was a young boy named Andy Sherrill. Andy was one of the finest young men I've ever met. He kept talking to me the whole time we were down, asking questions. We had a great conversation. But I saw many sites that uh, had a very deep meaning to me. After a while, we would begin to see the same thing over and over. I told the pilot, I said, well, I believe I'm ready to go up. We just said the same thing. He said, yes. He said, you're right. But he said, now, this is your trip. We'll stay down as long as you want to stay. Well, I said, I don't see him for staying any longer. I think we've seen everything. We started coming up. They got us out of the water, back onto the boat. I thought we'd been down 30 minutes at the very most. We'd been down an hour and 15 minutes. Right at the bottom of the English Channel, 
just looking. Great experience, what I'll never forget. I bet. And and they interviewed you for that documentary. You got to tell your story and they recorded it, right? The name of the documentary is D Day's Sunken Secrets. It is still available, I think. I'm not for sure. It is. I watched it last night. Oh, you did? Yeah. All two hours of it. Yeah. So well, it's a it's it's a it's a great program and I know um having hearing firsthand from people like you that were there. Um, I know is very important, you know, as we remember war and the, the horrible things that people like you had to go through. Well, that was the beginning. People locally around here began to ask me, would you come tell your story to us? Then school classes, uh, civic clubs, uh, things of that type. I said, well, I'll do the best I can. And it just got started and. Since then, I have done quite a bit of speaking. I had one church over at Mount Juliet, not too far from here. I went and spoke. A couple years later, they called me to come back. I said, well, my story is still the same. It hadn't changed. (laughs) I've told it once. They said, yeah, but our congregation wants to hear it again. Well, I went back, and that time, they had that church packed and jammed. And, uh, but I've been received far more than what I deserve. Dad can comment on this. I believe that, uh, at the time I remember him, you, the question was what made him start talking after all of those years of not talking? I think his, uh, his concern for our country right now, uh, I think he is concerned that this is not being taught to the younger generation and he decided that uh, perhaps to get this information out and make this younger generation appreciate what our history is like, I think that prompted him to start speaking up as well. Am I right, Dad? That's, that's very correct. It uh, just irritates me that we have taken God out of our schools. And if I was from another nation somewhere, complained about something, would get attention, but I'm American, help fight to save uh, freedom. And now when I go by school, I have to see a police car sitting there. That, that grabs me, but you think that our leaders care what I think? None whatsoever. And if I can talk and convince one person that our freedom is the highest priced thing this nation has ever bought, then all my effort will be worthwhile. Tell tell me a little bit. You you talked about your ship sank. Tell us about um, how that happened and what you remember about that. We were on a fourth trip in. It was 11, 11.30 in the morning. We were supposed to beach about one. The tide would, would be in about one. So we anchored out five miles from the beach, Omaha Beach. Had lunch. I came out of the galley, walking down the side of the ship along the rail, up towards the bow. A couple of soldiers standing there talking, and I don't know, I just stopped. And we started the conversation. We talked a few minutes. One of them said, this is our truck right here. Let's just get in and sit down. So the three of us did. We had much more than got in that truck. I know it wasn't three minutes. So we hit this mine. We had hoisted anchor, turned and taken our position to go into the beach. And just we passed over a big, large swell. This was June the 19th, the beginning of that three day storm. If you're familiar with that, water was very rough. We passed right over. A swell went out. We dropped down and hit a mine that did place there for a destroyer or something drew a lot of water. There was no competition for that mine. It blew the ship completely in two. The bow went one way, the stern went the other way. I was in this truck. The debris began to fall down. I'd have been crushed or, or certainly hurt by falling debris, if nothing else. But I was protected from that truck. But when the 
debris quit falling. I got out. The soldiers would, I never saw them. I don't know where they made it or not. I doubt it. But I walked around. I'm standing there. I'm a poor swimmer. I had a choice. I had it. I want to drown. Start swimming or stay on the ship and go down. I'm standing there debating. And just back, what I thought was the last seconds, I heard somebody holler, Bill, Bill. I looked off on the port side. I guess 100, 125 feet. Was another medic from down Bow in Mississippi, named Jack Hamlin. Jack had got a boss of life raft loose. He said, You can't swim out of here. I said, I'll come in there and get you. Well, Jack was back at a safe distance, but when that bow went under, it made a suction to pull everything in with it. But he never flinched. He started coming right back in to the danger area. He got, I don't know, 10, 12, maybe 15 feet. I said, Jack, I jumped that far. And I did. We got on the life raft and started leaving. We picked up four soldiers. Two of them wasn't hurt too bad. But two of them was hurt extremely bad. One of them died before we got rid of him. But uh, we began to get back away, back on off. We stayed in that life raft until we were picked up. I'd, I usually say about a half hour. And I may be completely wrong with that. I don't tell that for the truth. But uh, they were trying to get everybody out of the water before they came to us. We were on a life raft. But those swells, I tell you, they, it was tough to stay on there. Finally, we were picked up by a small boat, LCVP, uh, headed into the beach, first aid station, and those swells had built up. There's no way we could get in. We'd advance a little bit, and here come a swell, knock us back farther than where we had gained. He fought, I guess, at least a half hour trying to get into the first aid station. Finally, he said, I just can't make it. Let me see if I can find a ship and pick you up. So he worked his way around to a lift to ship. The old skipper was standing there on the fantail watching all the activity. He said, you take any survivors? He said, I'll take all you bring me. With that, they dropped the wire basket over the side with rope on each end. We put the Army personnel one by one in the basket. They'd pull them up. For some reason, they took the basket up and left Jack and myself threw a cargo net over the side. Well, when we'd come up on top of the swell, we still had, see if I remember correctly, about a foot to jump to catch that net. Jack said, you want to go first or you want me to? I said, Jack, it doesn't matter. we got one chance. It's either yes or no. <laughs> he said, I'll go. We watched and saw the swell building up. He jumped and caught it, went up the net. I turned around. I began trying to watch. I saw one building up back. It, it worked its way up. At the peak, I jumped, caught the bottom of that net. I went up that net like a squirrel. I didn't have a <laughs> bit of trouble. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the old skipper was very accommodating, uh, put his hand on our shoulders, he said, you boys, go down to Gally and get you a cup of coffee, sandwich, or if you want anything to eat. I'll be down in a few minutes. So we went down there. And I took a swig of coffee and it wouldn't go down. I couldn't swallow. I looked at Jack. He couldn't. Neither one of us could swallow. A little bit, the captain came in. said, how you've always made it. We told him not too good. We couldn't swallow. Well, he said, uh, 
that that's probably clear up. I said I've cleared out a compartment for you right down the passageway there. I said go in there and go to bed. Maybe you rest and that will help you. But we did. But we rolled and we tumbled. We twisted. And we turned. We closed our eyes. We relived it. If we didn't, we re relived it. Sometime after midnight, I rolled over to Jack said, to Bill, you wake. I said, Jack, I think I'll never go to sleep again. He said, let's just get up. So we did. We went out on the open deck back on the fan tail. There's a little bench sitting back there next to the fan tail just long enough for two of us. We took our seats on that bench. Battleship over here behind us, firing. Germans over here firing back and forth. We were watching tracer bullets. I got thinking about those that I had seen and knew was dead. Even while I'd ask Jack, you know anything about so-and-so? Yeah, I saw him. He's dead. I'd been raised in Sunday school. God was good. God would take care of you. And, you know, Sunday school. What I'd seen and gone through, it's hard for me to believe that a God would allow. But later on, I found convinced that wasn't God's doing. That was man's doing. God created the perfect world. Man is the one that's causing the trouble. But anyway, I thought, well, maybe I'm an atheist. But still, that life raft appeared right there at the last second. Was that luck? Good time to be lucky. I thought about somebody else that had been killed. But then I thought about being in that truck where the debris didn't hit me. Was that luck? That ship stopped long enough for me to get off and get to that diaper raft. Was that luck? I sat there big part of the rest of the night, sometime before dawn, on the morning of June the 20th, 1944, on the far side of the world. No chaplain, no minister, no Sunday school teacher. I finally convinced myself that luck hadn't carried me that far. It had to be a power far greater than luck. It was God. Why do you think it's important for us to all hear these stories and to know what happened then when it happened so long ago? Why is it important for us to remember historical things like this? I think our freedom is the most expensive thing this station has ever bought outside of ships and planes and army equipment and ammunition. But the suffering that went on over there, those that was in, in the uh, death marches, uh, concentration camps, the blood that was shed, the pain that they went through, the tears that the mothers and the wives back home shed, the heartbreak that they had. When you figure all that into the price of our freedom, it's the most expensive thing we have ever bought. And you haven't asked for this, but it, it makes me ready to fight again. When I see people that refuse to stand for the national anthem, that's not freedom. They need to be taught, carried back to school, taught the difference between freedom and respect. They have no respect for the price that's been paid. We all have freedom to do that. But thank goodness some of us still stand for the, the flag. 
Okay, thanks so much, Bill. We're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we're going to find out what happened after you left the service. The West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center in Brownsville, Tennessee, at exit 56 off I-40, offers an authentic Southern experience showcasing the history and culture of rural West Tennessee. Inside, visitors can learn about the history of cotton, explore the scenic and wild Hatchie River, and get to know the legendary musicians who call West Tennessee home. Also located on the grounds is Flag Grove School, the childhood school of Tina Turner and the last home of blues pioneer Sleepy John Estes. To learn more about the center, visit westtnheritage.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Bill Allen. Uh, Bill, tell us a little bit about your life after you returned home from the war. Well, I came home. I had been promised a job with a telephone company, but if they had so many former employees coming back, it, they were slow about calling. So I worked at the post office for about a year. The telephone company finally called. They wanted me to report to another Gallatin working in a line crew. Well, I decided I'd be better off where I was than to go into a line crew. So I stayed at the post office until they came out with a ruling that you had to have civil service to work. Well, I didn't hadn't passed civil service, but I took the test and passed it. Went to work at the Veterans Administration in Nashville. I then had, I guess, that two or two and a half years going back and forth. And my father was in bad health. When I was in Nashville, I needed to be in Murfreesboro. When I was in Murfreesboro, I needed to be. So I came back home, started working at a funeral home, driving an ambulance. I had been, there was work in the Navy as a corpsman. I worked there. I guess three or three and a half years, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It's beginning to get a little bit old. I decided I need to make up my mind that I want to stay with that or get into something else. But I had an opportunity to leave, go as office manager, firm here in town. I took that job but they called me back on weekends and nights to help them at funeral home. I stayed as office manager there for two, three years. I had a chance to go with Mercer Electric Department where benefits were good and uh, money was a little better. So I made a change. Started out in charge of the warehouse, soon made purchasing agent wound up as superintendent of general services 32 years there of course for electric department. I retired, stayed off 10 years. Wife well, myself, we traveled, we went to Hawaii, went to Alaska, all up in New England, all out west, Seattle, down the coast, uh, caught the Amtrak, rode out to Portland, Oregon one day. Rained a car and drove down to San Francisco. Took us four days. We enjoyed life. The man that owned the funeral home had died and his son had taken over. He kept asking me to come back and help him. Finally, he called one day. He said, look, I said, I have got to have more help and I can't find anybody. Won't you please come back and help me? Well, I said, I'd be a poor person not to help you if I could. What's the least I can do? He said, you just work two nights a week. Well, I said, I'll do that for you. Well, it lasted less than a month. I went in one afternoon. The boy said, I need you to go with me. I said, sure. We'll go out and get in the funeral coach, go to Nashville, pick up the lady at the hospital. 
had started making pickups. It wasn't a month later. Can you help us on a funeral tomorrow afternoon? I said, yeah. Well, I was back in full time before I knew it. <laughs> I spent 15 more years out there at funeral home. I worked a funeral on my 91st birthday. <laughs> but uh, I went on death call one night soon after that. And I then fell away over 400 pounds. And I decided that was time to quit. I, <laughs> I made one trip too many. <laughs> I got back, pitched my key on the desk. The owner said, what's that? I said, that's my key. You got it. He said, that's your key. He, he said, you keep that as long as you live. <laughs> so I still have a key to the business. <laughs> but uh, it's a souvenir now more than anything else. But he's dead now. But uh, that's been my, my life was 32 years, really, with Lakewood Department. And uh, really, from the beginning to the time I end, it spanned over about 65 years. Part time, full time, on call, just whenever they needed me. So uh, that's been my my life since I've been back home. And I know you've got a big family. Well, I have a wife. I have two daughters. I have uh, four grandchildren. Right now, I have. Uh, about six and a half great grandchildren. <laughs> so uh, that's been, and I have a couple of nieces that live down in Jackson, Tennessee. Well, one of them lives in Jackson, the other one has left. She lives in Tacoma, Washington now, but uh, I still have a daughter that lives in Jackson, Tennessee. So uh, that's pretty well my family. I had one brother growing up, and uh, he died in uh, 2013. I went down. To, he had been bedridden, bed health for all oh, about a year. We were down, I think, on a Saturday. See him, and uh, I tried to talk to him about the end, and he had bills that I just don't want to talk about it. And I said. I can understand. That's okay. But after I left, he told my niece, she said, I don't know why. I said, Bill was right. I said, we need to talk about some things. I said, when I die, you call Bill and tell him, come get me. Take me back to Murfreesboro. The following Saturday, about 7 o'clock, Saturday morning, she called me. He died in his sleep during the night. But uh, I did. I went to Jackson, got him, carried him back, brought him back here in Murfreesboro. Ten weeks to the day later, my niece called me. Said, Uncle Bill, said, mother just passed away. Can you come get her? I said, I'll be there in about two and a half hours. So they both are back here now. and uh, But that's basically been my family. That's great. Well, I know that you are coming to speak here at Discovery Park. We're excited about that. Um, are you, uh, have you been to Discovery Park before? Just before the virus hit, the state of Tennessee employees, uh, I don't know where it was all, or just, I know the man that carried me down was a church tea here. And, uh, but they, the state had a meeting, one in Union City, one here, and one in Oak Ridge. And he arranged me to speak at all three of them. And we went down one afternoon, spent the night, and I spoke the next morning, I believe it was. No, I spoke that afternoon. And we spent the night and then came back the next day. But I have been there to the ball. You got a great attraction there. Thank you. We're, we're looking forward to having you again. And on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for your service. And thank you for continuing to share your story. Well, you're more than welcome. I hope I'm not ever bore anybody. But uh, 
and I don't ask to speak, but if I, anybody wants to hear it, I don't mind telling them. But uh, look forward to seeing you. Thanks to all of you listeners who have joined Bill, Emily, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.